And hi, once again, guess what? In case you didn't guess, it is time for another episode of Unstoppable Mindset. And today we get to talk to Joseph Stevens from Australia. He is a, a long way time-wise from us here in Southern California, as well as distance-wise. Joseph and I met because we both use an audio editing program called Reaper, and we're on a list together called, here it comes, Reaper Without Peepers. Guess what that means, of course. And it's all about blind people using the program. And Reaper is an incredibly good program from an access standpoint, because some people have devoted a lot of time to making it and ancillary scripts that go with it. Very usable by blind people who otherwise couldn't use the program um, and the sophistication that it brings. Anyway, Joseph and I met on that, and we've been chatting some, and I finally purveyed on him to come on Unstoppable Mindset. So, Joseph, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. <laughs> Thank you. It's really great to be here. And uh, yes, it's it's funny. Actually, we heard about you a long time ago because some old gentleman who came to our house church once, he, uh, he gave my sons a book called Thunderdog. And um, they read it, and then they read it to me, and I thought, "Oh yeah, that sounds fantastic." And it was, you know, it's quite, quite uh, inspiring. And I'm on this Reaper without peepers list, and um, this name came up, you know, Michael Hinkson. I said, "I'm sure that name sounds familiar. I reckon, <laughs> I reckon that's the author of that book." So I checked with the boys, and and then I contacted Michael, and I I had to get the boys to say good day to him, and you know, and uh, yeah, so here we are. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> and now we've got to get me to Australia. We got to work out some speaking things sometime to to get us down there now that travel is opened again. Oh but yes. Yeah. That's another story. Well, why don't we start by you telling us a little about you growing up and what a younger Joseph was like and all that sort of stuff and we'll go from there. Well, interestingly, I was born uh, with about 2% vision, with the same condition that you were, uh, but it was never explained to me that uh, retrolenteral fibroplasia was the same thing as uh, prematurity of, of uh, retin retinopathy of prematurity. They, no one ever explained that to me. They just said my retinas didn't form properly, and I was born with um, cerebral palsy and um, brain damage, as the doctor uh, explained to my mum, and and. My doctor said to my mom that I would never live a normal life. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. And of course, no one defines normal either. But anyway. Well, this is true. But um, yeah, but yeah, I hear you. Uh, I, I had parents, I guess, similar to yours. They, they were risk takers. They didn't treat me any different uh, at all. Um, but it took a long time for mom to even get a response out of me because I, I did have the, the brain damage and... Um, it was probably, um, I don't know, when I was two and a half or three, when mum sort of started making any progress with me. I mean, I, I wouldn't even, I couldn't even sit up. I couldn't do anything. Um, but if you knew me now, you, you would just have no idea that that's where I started. So now I'm married. I've been married for 27 years. Um, last week with our 27th anniversary, we've had uh, 10 children, nine living, one with the Lord. Um, I'm a software engineer who's worked for uh, Freedom Scientific, Vispero, Henry Joyce, going back um, for close on 27 years. Um, I do um, radio firmware for amateur radio to, to make uh, radios accessible. I do music production. Um, I do original music, um, a drummer, singer, keyboard. I've written about six books. I can use all power tools, you know, circular saw. I, I live on a farm, 200 acres. So, you know, I do fencing and repairs of goat sheds. And yesterday we were out plucking, plucking geese. I did three geese yesterday. And um, so like you, there's, there's not much that has stopped me. And um, I never think about those things, though I, I, one thing I'd have to probably disagree with you with, with and that is um, you, while blindness isn't the issue, Sometimes we don't understand how our blindness affects others. And I think that's, that's particularly been true with me having nine, nine children. Um, that has been quite a difficulty. Um, so, you know, when, when, when you're by yourself and you're living your life as a blind person, really nothing 
needs to stop you. But uh, there are things that that happen in life and that that are quite difficult as a blind person, where attitude alone isn't going to solve the problem. But you know, um, having said that, I've still accomplished a lot more than a lot of sighted people have. Um, I also was the first totally blind person to uh, do a, math, a maths and science degree. In fact, the first totally blind student in South Australia to do matriculation, maths and physics, and then uh, the computer science degree at, at Flinders University. Um, in 1987, I rode to Canberra to raise money for the bike, uh, Bible Society for Bike for Bibles. That was a distance of 1,486 kilometres. So um, there's... There's a lot that I've been able to accomplish in life and not that I've ever thought about it. I don't kind of think, well, what's my next accomplishment? I just do what comes in front of me to do. And um, we've got, there's a proverb that says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. And that's what I believe. And so that's, that's kind of been my ethos. So um, one, one question that, that comes to mind in, um, well, in, in, going back to the discussion that you had about blindness can be difficult. And, and that is absolutely true. I don't disagree with that. What I would say, however, is that attitudes, or maybe it's better to put it a different way. A lack of education makes the difficulty a lot more of a barrier than it needs to be. And what a lot of us don't get to do, don't want to do, or don't know how to do is to, to allow the teaching part of us to come out so that when there are issues that arise and we're different because blindness, isn't the only thing that can create difficulties. And anytime anyone is different, there are difficulties that inherently come from what people accept as the norm. And the sooner that we recognize that the norm is not what we think of it, the better chance we have of dealing with all the other challenges that we face. And that would be what I would would say about blindness is that that blindness isn't the problem. It may be our approach. It may be the approach of other people. um, But the, the reality is that the problem comes because we don't learn how we societally don't learn how to deal with things that are different than we. And that's where the real challenge comes from. Yes. And I think actually we've gone backwards a lot in our education uh, system because I I wrote an article a couple of years ago about the rise and fall of life skills of blind people, particularly here in Australia. Like, you know, we, we've heard of like 13 year olds who can't turn on the shower for themselves and, mm-hmm. and, 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 and children who can't use scissors at school because they're, you know, they're, they're dangerous. I mean, my goodness, if, if they knew what our school did in Adelaide back in, in the, in the seventies and eighties and where we, we went into these, you know, tech studies, um, uh, center and we used a bandsaw and, and, you know, sanding yeah. disc and wood lathe and drill. And, you know, as I said, I, I use a circular saw all the time and, you know, they, <laughs> I've still got all my 10 fingers, yeah. but, but these days they're, and I think, I, I don't know whether you did, you'd agree with me, but there is a place for specialized education and there's a, and there's a place for integration into, into the sighted world. Um, but there's a delicate balance between them because if you don't have the the special education where where teachers are challenging and blind students can can uh, key off of each other and and compete and and realize um, and and be part of of the well ha- let, let me put it another way teachers still need to to, to teach things in a way that um, that are optimized for a blind person. For instance, sure. teaching tech studies is very different to a blind person than a sighted person. And if you don't have that education, obviously, uh, you, you know it's going it's going to be difficult. Um, so I loved what you said in your your introductory speech about Braille, for instance. That you know, well, you know, you teach you teach sighted people print, right? Well, why not teach blind people Braille? And, and it's the same with with all such skills. You know, we we. Uh, th- I I think we th- we thrived because I had the opportunity 
you know, to learn to cook, to learn to do woodwork, to learn to do clay, to learn to do leather work, to learn to do, you know, plastic. Um, basically, every the only thing I didn't get to do was metal work, which is which was a shame because I do know a blind guy that can weld, and I'd love to be able to do that. And my, my sons are learning that now, and they're they're sort of twelve and fourteen. So maybe I'll maybe I'll take that up too. But you know, blindness. For in the in the context of education, certainly isn't the the issue. You're right. It, it is it is the attitude and the um, the willingness of others to to take risks. It it is. Um, we we do need to recognize, though, as a society, that there is nothing wrong with having good knowledgeable, and this is the part that I think is most important, philosophically sound teachers that can deal with the blindness issues. The problem is that a lot of the teachers, so-called experts in the field of work with the blind, <clears throat> themselves aren't necessarily doing the best job and providing the best services. For example, Braille, now in this country, according to the National Federation of the Blind, has a has a literacy rate of under 10%. Wow. And when I was growing up, the comment was a, it was around 50%. The, yeah, that's, the that's difficulty incredible. is the difficulty is that um we we've done several things. We've got a lot of blind kids who are not totally blind, they're low vision. I won't say visually impaired because <laughs> yes, I think yes. that is a total <laughs> disservice to everyone, but <laughs> low vision and teachers say, well, as long as you've got some eyesight, you should use that. Never mind the fact that with that eyesight, you may only be able to read a few words a minute. You've got to use high magnification devices and so on. Whereas if you also learned Braille, you would be able to read more. You would be able to read faster and probably more effective. But I absolutely agree with that because, yeah. you know, I didn't I didn't learn Braille till I was eight or nine. And the only reason I learned it was because the print in my textbooks was starting to get too small. And I think we should have learned it right from the beginning, like you mm -hmm. said, because who knows when your sight, um, you know, whether your sight condition is going to be uh, stable and also even whether the print, well, it's a fact as, as you um, – go on in, in your primary education, the print gets smaller in the books. Yeah. And so and, that was, and, yeah. And the reality is that Braille is a true alternative, not a substitute for print. And now with technology, we can do a much better job even of creating graphics and so on and um, providing graphical representations. You know, when you were growing up, you, I don't know how much access you had to to good drawings and physics and oh, so on, but yeah, it it is better now because there's more technology to help with that. And technology has made a great deal of difference in our access to information overall. But still, it isn't the technology that's the ultimate game changer that needs to happen. It's yeah. still full education. And let me tell you a story about that. Yeah, I was spoiled at school because I had a an orientation and mobility teacher who was brilliant at map making. He was absolutely brilliant at map making. He knew he knew how much detail to put on so that it was useful, that it wasn't too much and it wasn't too little. <clears throat> and when I moved to Tasmania in uh, 2018, I asked for a map, a road map, and. The blindness agency told me that no one in the history of Tasmania had ever asked for a Braille map. And so they had to send away to get it made. And it was atrocious. The first one came back um, with just roads, so you had no towns, so you yeah. couldn't reference the towns from the roads. The next one came back with towns without roads, so you had no way of, of, of mapping them together. And it was just I, – I gave up. After the third attempt, I gave up. Because the, the the skill level of map making was gone. And yeah, yeah I did radio electronics and um, it was a real frustration to get diagrams because for some reason, sighted people don't know how to do um, tactile diagrams in such a way that 
either they're either they're too small and you can't feel the detail or they're too big and they don't have enough detail and like with roadmaps you know they they'd use like they'd do a map with a single intersection on it and and think it was useful yeah <laughs> it's like come on guys <laughs> the problem is that we are viewed as inferior and not as equals in society who need to have the same access to information. I had a, um, a an interesting experience happen to me recently. And if, if you listen to enough of podcasts from Unstoppable Mindset, you'll hear about my view that disability does not mean a lack of ability and that everyone has a disability. People who can see have the disability of light dependence and you yes, don't do well that. when the lights go out and you want proof. I, I won a contest to go to the Kelly and Ryan Oscar after party, which was at the Dolby theater where the Oscars were held the Monday morning, right after the Oscars. Um, somebody entered my name. I didn't even know they did. It was very nice of them. And when uh, I got a call saying you're a winner, I was at a winner of what? And the, the person told me. And when I when I went back to the person who I figured had entered my name, she said, yeah, I entered your name. I didn't think you stood a chance. Well, hello. Anyway, we go to the hotel. We arrive Saturday afternoon, about 10 after three, go in, put up our luggage. It was me, my niece and nephew. <clears throat> and we started walking downstairs and suddenly everybody started screaming around us. And I said to my niece, so what's going on? We lost power in the hotel and in the surrounding area, she said. Now, she knew me. She wasn't worried. But everyone was screaming because suddenly they couldn't see because there was no light. And all of a sudden, the little flashlight started going on. Don't tell me for one single second that sighted people don't have a disability. It's just that technology has covered it up so much. It doesn't mean, however, that the disability isn't there. And the sooner that we recognize that all of us have challenges of one sort or another and that we need to accept people where they are, the better off we'll be. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've got lots of stories like that, too, even, even at home, you know, when the lights go out. But, but you know, we can I, – I, <laughs> I've been up fixing doors and putting doors back on, on their, you know, the hinges and stuff on at 11 o'clock when all the lights are out and, you know, doing yeah. – doing repairs and, you know, and one of my know. favorite stories is when I was in, in college, I think I was a junior and I was in my room. Um, I had a single dorm room because I had enough braille books that <laughs> there was no room for anyone else to, to be in the room. And I was reading something, studying away. And some people walked by outside my open window and just for, for just general sociability, I said, hey, how are you guys doing out there? And they stopped and they went, um, we're fine. Who are you? And I said, I'm Mike. Well, the lights are off. And I said, yeah, what are you doing? I'm reading my physics book. And of course, they couldn't get it. Um, and I finally said, it happens to be in Braille. But, but you know, <laughs> who cares about the lights, right? Now, I understand that I need to care about the lights for my sighted friends who are less fortunate than I. Um but we all have challenges where we're less fortunate than others in some way. And, oh, you know, we all need to, to deal with that. And you, you have done, you know, so many different things. I took wood shop, but my shop teacher would not let me work the bandsaw or the lathe <laughs> or any of those things, which I kind of regret. I do believe that I would have had no trouble learning to do them. But he was pretty restrictive in that way. So someone else had to cut out wood things for me that I then, all I basically did was a lot of sanding, you know, but that was the way it was. So um, it was better than a lot of things that, that could have happened. Um, mostly at the high school, the teachers were pretty good. And so I, I did pretty well in, in high school overall. But that one shop thing, you know, that was just kind of the way it was. And uh, so you, you do what you got to do. But I believe that uh, for me, I learned Braille in kindergarten, but then I forgot it because I didn't get to use it for the first three years we were out in California. So I had to relearn it. So I appreciate where you're coming from. <clears throat> but I did learn it again and was able to keep up with it. And 
believe that Braille is absolutely something that any person who is totally blind and any person who is otherwise partially blind should learn. And I like the, oh, absolutely. I love the National Federation of the Blind can, the definition of blindness, which is you're blind from a functional standpoint if your eyesight has diminished to the point where you have to use alternatives to pure eyesight in order to function. And if you're at that point, you should learn blindness techniques because the odds are, as you said earlier, you're going to lose the rest of that eyesight. But also philosophically, you get to use both blindness techniques and the eyesight that you have to be able to function. But if you learn to use them both, you're much better off. It's interesting <clears throat> because when I lost my sight, I didn't actually know that I'd completely lost it. What happened was, as I said, I was born with about 2%. And, and that doesn't sound like much, but it was enough to walk around. It was mm -hmm. enough to walk to the deli, the, the shop, the mm -hmm. uh, what I guess you guys call it a drugstore um, from my house. It's you know, a couple of kilometers, maybe three or four kilometers without a cane. Yeah. Um, so 2% is quite, quite a lot, um, even though it doesn't sound like much. But one day I was riding uh, a bicycle behind my friend and I kept running into them. And I, all of a sudden, I realized that I actually couldn't see anymore. See, what happens is my brain recreates what should be there. It's like watching a video. And I have lapses in that video sometimes when I'm really concentrating on something. And all of a sudden, I realize I'm not seeing what I'm um, out my eyes. But but actually, what I'm seeing it out my eyes is all created by my, mm -hmm. my mind. And... Um, so I don't know that I can't see until I go to try and touch what should be there. And it's not because um, my brain has, has, you know, got the wrong picture for the wrong situation sort of thing. So it's very interesting. And so someone asked, someone once asked me, um, what's it like being totally blind? Because one eye is totally blind. The other one, well, it's, it's, it is totally blind now too, but one eye I have, I have, mental video the other eye i have nothing and i and i like to say to them it's like looking out your left ear yeah if you can look out your left ear it's absolutely nothing it's not darkness it's not darkness people need to understand that it is not darkness it's nothing and there's mm -hmm. a big difference yeah there's a big difference and, mm. yeah sorry what were you going to say no no I, I was just agreeing with you there's a <laughs> there's a big difference well but you um you know i grew up um, and didn't use a cane or a guide dog until I was 14. But I learned the areas and I learned to listen extremely well. So our elementary schools were very open. They weren't just like a single building. And so walking down sidewalks, there were roofs over the sidewalks and they were held up by poles. And I didn't run into the poles because I learned to hear the poles and could avoid them. And, and so I was able to do that. I was able to ride a bike around the neighborhood and so on. Eventually, my brother and I started doing a paper route together. And so we did a, he had a tandem bike to, to do that. But still, for a lot of the area around my neighborhood, I could ride a bike and, and do all the same things that the other kids did. In reality, I didn't do a lot of things that they did. I didn't play baseball or other things like that. And I found other ways to entertain myself or to watch them, if you will. But, you know, the, the fact is that the brain is a wonderful thing. Well, look at you. You had cerebral palsy. You worked through that. Your brain worked through that. And probably you developed other neural pathways to be able to accomplish the things that, that you needed to do, which are now just part of what you normally do. Yeah, exactly. In fact, um, I was able to remember pi, you know, pi 3.141592653589793. I was able yeah, to remember that to I was able to remember that to 200 decimal places. There you are. So so the doctors were I mean, I I honestly attribute all of all of what I've been able to accomplish to God because it's a miracle compared to where I was at. Um it was a lot of hard work. Yes. Yeah. Um but it was also a lot of determination on the part of my mother and on the part of my teachers on the, and, and also constantly being challenged. I guess I've always um, felt like 
Uh, I want to be one step ahead. Yeah. It's what yeah, you got to so, do. Yeah. So yeah. you went to college, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. What did you do then when you got out of college? Well, it's all <laughs> well for the first few months, I actually went back to Malaysia with, um, with my, well, who's now my wife. And I had an interesting story there because we, we went to Malaysia and we were staying there and I really needed to get a job. I needed to get some money and, and, um, um, I, I I applied to all these places to do computer programming, and this one place I ended up. Um, they gave me an interview, and I walked in there, and I I was really trying hard to um, pretend I wasn't blind. And um, Mary, my wife, um, now she you know she went in with me, and you know we just casually sat down and did the interview. He said nothing about my blindness or anything, and right at the end, the guy looks at me and he goes. Um, how do you do this stuff? Okay, what do you mean? Uh, you you look like you're you look like you're blind. Uh, I said, oh, um, oh, I've got a talking computer. Um, anyway, he gave me the job. I mean, he gave me the a task to to do that afternoon. They they had this massive uh, this bug that they couldn't fix in in their system. Um, the it had overflowed their capacity, and I um I went home and three hours later I I'd, I'd solved the problem. I went back and they and they gave me the job, but it, it, it there was a lot of prejudice in Malaysia far more than than in a Western country. I mean, it was so bad that that my wife didn't like um, me having a cane, and um, because it just drew so much attention, and um, <clears throat> it ended up causing us to fall into a, a, a storm drain, which is, you know, like six feet deep and full of mush and, 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 and slush at the bottom. And um, we had to climb out of that. And But, you know, the, the, the stigma there is, is far worse than here. In fact, it was so bad, we ended up coming back here. But mm. I was able to get a job there uh, through sheer, you know, determination and... and well, and, and in a sense, good on that boss. He was perceptive enough... But more important than that, he asked you rather than just turning you down and shutting you the great. door. He was great. Yeah, I mean, he'd studied in Australia, so I think he he had a bit more exposure to to um, the fact that people with disabilities had more opportunities here than they did there. I mean, there, blind people. I only ever met one that had um, like a, a job as a tele telephonist in a bank, but most of them were, you know, sniffing lighter. Uh, fluid and 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 um, you know busking on the street with a keyboard just playing random notes and if they had if they were, were even able to do that there was one lady that was selling tissues and um, helped by a granddaughter to get to that spot on the bridge every day and you know the, the, there was a lot of I feel I truly do feel blessed I mean I yeah. I know that seventy five percent of blind people are out of work so you know yeah. But it, we can only do what we can do. And like I said, the other side of it is that for those of us who can and are willing to do it, we need to allow our teaching skills to come through to help educate um, because that's really what it's, what it's about. And um, there are, there, even in this country, there are so many times that the so-called experts are the ones that are the biggest roadblocks. Um, there's an organization that started this whole thing about dining in the dark and their, their logic was so eat in the dark and you can see what it's like to be a blind person, which is totally false, which is totally obnoxious. And it doesn't teach you anything except to be more prejudiced about blind people and blindness, because what you don't get is the training uh, and every sighted person gets training on how to eat and tie their shoes and so on. Why should it be different for us? Mm. Yeah. Well, so you had that software job and, um, and then, but then you went back to Australia and, and started conversing with the kangaroos, I trust. Oh yes. Yeah. So when we came back here, um, I actually still worked for that Malaysian company for a little while, but it, it became, um, well, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, um, 
profitable enough because the dollar was like a third yeah. of, of our dollar. So I, I ended up giving that away. And I work, went to work for the Royal Society for the Blind as a, as a, uh, a um, assistive technology officer finding solutions for, for blind mm. people because um, someone had put a recommendation into the that they should hire me. And um, I went over to the CSUN conference in 1999 because oh. um, I'd already done some contracts with um, – with the Henter Joyce in terms of scripting before that time, but 1999, I went over to the CSUN conference and um, and I met Eric Damarini and and uh, he said, "Oh, so will you work for us?" And I said, "On one condition." He goes, "What's that?" And I said, um, "I work from home." Okay, <laughs> so from July 1999, um, a couple of months after our first child was born. I started working full time for them, and then I, I went into systems um, programming rather than just scripting. And uh, the rest is history. Um, I have about ten patents, um, ten inventions that um, mm -hmm. I added to the company, and um, yeah, um, all of the well, lots of the heavy lifting for Jaws has been done from either Adelaide or Tasmania. Well, and for those who don't know JAWS, that stands for Job Access with Speech, is a software program called a screen reader. And what it does is it verbalizes the text video that comes across the screen. It isn't necessarily itself great at graphics, uh, but it's not intended to be the artificial intelligence solution, at least at this point, unless there are things going on that Joseph isn't telling us about yet. But no, it's the, coming. <laughs> yeah, I know it will come. Um, but the reality is that it is the predominant piece of technology that we who happen to be blind use to interact with a computer. It's the the most popular screen reader, although there's a charge for it. There are a couple of screen reader software packages that are out there that are that are free or much less cost. But the other part about Freedom Scientific and JAWS is that they've been doing this a long time. And so JAWS has clearly gotten a lot more done and, and can interact in a lot of ways that the others are still playing catch up to get to. I remember we were the first <clears throat> screen reader to, to work with Microsoft Office. And the things we, we did was so unconventional. I mean, I can't go into the, the technical stuff, but we really... Um, did everything possible to get information out of the application. And so, mm -hmm. you know, a screen reader doesn't just build a model of the screen. It, it figures out what's going on in the application, what needs to be spoken, um, what the user wants to know, because there's a big difference between accessibility and productivity. <clears throat> and usability. Some, and usability. Something can be... Uh, something can be totally accessible but totally unusable. I won't name yep. any applications right now, but um, <laughs> the blind people who I are could. out there who knows who knows what's going on in the world knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. But um, the reality is, you you need both. You need accessibility and usability. And and the idea of Jaws is to try and allow blind people to be as productive as their sighted counterpart, not just to give the ability, uh, not just the uh, give the the ability to to hear what's on the screen, but to make them productive. What is so frustrating about being a JAWS user is when Microsoft, for example, updates Windows, and at least this is the way I've heard it a number of times, doesn't quickly or ahead of time pass along to the screen reader manufacturers the things that are about to be updated so that when the updates actually roll out, the screen reader updates can roll out as well. And the result is you're always playing catch up and we're always the victims of things not working for a while until you can play catch up. Yeah. I mean, that, <clears throat> that that's generally true. Although I must say Microsoft have been a lot, a lot better in recent years. Yeah. I believe us, that's true. At, at giving us leeway and, um, and time. Um, but, but there's always, <clears throat> There's always the the issue of you know cycles whether our cycle um, matches with meshes with their development cycle and and things like that you know we we have to do a lot of um, stuff to jumping through hoops to get stuff done on time still. Do you find that 
Microsoft makes life any more difficult because, of course, they want to promote Narrator, which is the built-in screen reader inside of Windows. <laughs> oh, it's very frustrating because um, they people often come to us and say, well, Nar Narrator works, uh, but Narrator doesn't work in the same way that JAWS does. Mm -hmm. And um, quite often what, what, what they pass for accessibility uh, is just... <sighs> It doesn't. It just doesn't cut it. So um, while narrator might say something, um, anyway, I guess I, I'm not really here to bash narrator. But well, no, I don't want to, and I didn't want to yeah, bash narrator. Yeah, it was just yeah. more of a, a curiosity. But 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 you're right. And and look, um, there are a number of screen readers, and there's an advantage to having been around longer. I think my first exposure to Jaws was in 1996 um oh, yeah, 1.21 or something something like that yeah <laughs> and it came it came in this big box with a whole bunch of tapes that i cassettes and i went through all the lessons oh, but yeah. it was it was the best thing and at that time it was probably about the only thing around and so i've been using jaws ever since and and thoroughly oh. enjoying it um, and love to see how it continues to progress and all of the, the various clever things that are that are going on. I, I, I remember back great. in those days, the um, <laughs> I was such a skeptic because there were there were other screen readers that just crashed all the time mm -hmm. that, that were absolutely atrocious. And when someone said, "Oh, try Jaws," I really didn't expect anything of it. After I'd already tried like a handful of screen readers, I was so pleasantly surprised. And 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 the fact is that the reason why it was such a success is because of the number of blind people that are involved in its development. Yeah, we know what we need, and we have to get it done for our own job. And so, you know, Jaws for me is far more than a job. It's it's my baby. It's it's another one of my children. It's my oldest child, in fact. And, um, you know, we as a company, we we absolutely listen to users. The the biggest trouble is, we've usually got way 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 more stuff to fix and do than than you know we have people to do it. And and that's typically why things take longer. And of course. You make one little change in a in a mature package like this, and you're likely to break something for someone yeah. somewhere. Yeah, and so it's really hard now to to get fixes in because you you really have to be so careful that you don't mess up someone else's job just because you make a change for one person who's who's he's screaming loudly enough. So it's 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 a balancing act for sure. And, you know, um, then the other part about it is you've got people like Eric Damery who really got it. And that's right. And who truly understood it. Uh, Eric is going to definitely be missed for retiring. Oh, yeah. Definitely. And you know, it's like with Kurzweil Education System, Stephen Baum, the same way. Yep. Um, mm. A person who, who got it, who understood blindness as well as anyone could, um, and who was committed to truly making a product that worked, which is what it was really all about. And so right. people like that are, are sorely going to be missed and other people will hopefully come along who will do the same thing, but freedom scientific has done a, a really great job with what's happened with jaws. Um, uh, and you're and so, right. There, there's so many different definitions of accessibility. It's amazing. Right, which I guess leads us to uh, the next topic, which, which is you know accessibility in general. I I am such so passionate about accessibility. I get very frustrated when um, someone comes out with a new invention supposedly for the blind, and it's so bug ridden that that it's yeah. just not usable. But um, anyway, um, that leads me to amateur radio, uh, which I also wanted to make accessible. And I know that you're an amateur radio operator too, and so. so um, since 1964. Wow, a lot longer than me. I, I uh, only got my license in 2015. But um, <laughs> there was this guy who was reverse engineering uh, Chinese firmware. And um, we got hold of that project. And um, he started adding voice prompts. And I really appreciated what he did. 
um, but it became a closed project. So we sort of branched it off and, and kept it open and, and added heaps more features and also added. Um, so what we do is we, we, we get a Chinese radio, we reverse engineered the firmware, we added voice prompts so that everything on the radio spoke, including, you know, entering frequencies and um, literally everything. There was nothing. It was 100%, 100% accessible and usable. And this is for a whole bunch of Chinese radios with a similar chipset. And um, there's another open source project that I've been doing that with as well. So um, even even that landscape has changed dramatically. And, um, you know, it's a lot of work, but it's it's been very rewarding doing that too. Yeah, and the the landscape changes, the sophistication changes, and so there are a lot of things like that that make it even, you know, much more interesting going forward. I have a Kenwood 570, so that's old. I mean, I bought it in 2000, and I actually haven't set up an antenna here, and I've lived here for quite a while and really should, but I've been using a, a service partly on the phone um, called Echolink to be able to communicate, but I also do have a, a Kenwood two-meter walkie-talkie, and love ham radio but uh, like everything as you said the whole landscape is changing yeah i mean i i um, did amateur radio for i mean the, the firmware for about two and a half years because i was doing programming during the day i started to get burnt out so mm. now i've sort of switched gears and now i'm doing music production with an old friend from adelaide who i started singing with back in 1986 so now that's what i tend to do in my spare time and that's what you use Reaper for. That's right. What a game changer that is. Well, I'm so grateful to those guys. <laughs> yeah, Reaper. And then there are a couple of, of scripts um, uh, like uh, uh, Mr. Snowbarker, among others, but also other things that have truly made it accessible. Um, and I know that I use it in, in a very simple way on dealing with editing a lot of audio and so on. But still, it is such a such a game changer as you said and just reading so many things that are being done by so many different people who happen to be blind in the whole music production world and they're and they're talking about things that are way above my pay grade i could learn them but i'm not really interested in doing music production but i love reaper um, and, and it works really well and again it's one of those things that isn't even a very expensive product for anyone it's like sixty dollars to get a license for it and uh in the u.s and it works really well so it's a way to be able to edit these podcasts and do all the things that are necessary to to make them sound reasonably decent and so on and which is a lot of fun well and again i think this brings me back to the maybe one of our such an important topic um this unstoppable mindset this unstoppable mindset is not something that other people do and everyone just enjoys the fruit of. Everyone can be part of it. You know, I'm, I do my bit in the community. You do your bit in the community. Uh, someone else does their bit in the community. But if, if everyone excels at, and does the best that they can do, it contributes to the whole blind community and everyone's lives can be impacted. The whole blind community and beyond, actually. Right. Um, but if, if but if everyone's just a consumer yeah. and leaves it to everybody else to do, well, nothing gets done. I um, My wife passed away in November, and so I have more time on my own. We were basically married 40 years, and I know that wow. she's around here, so I need to continue to behave because if I don't, I'm going to hear from her, so I've got to watch my P's and Q's, which is fine. But one of the things that happened here last year was that, uh, like every year, our homeowners association has a uh, uh, board of directors and we have elections every year. And last year, by the time the elections were supposed to happen, they didn't have a quorum. And I think it took two extensions before they finally got enough votes to have a quorum. Well, this year, I decided to run. And one of the main things that I've said 
at meetings that we've had, and I've said at emails and so on, is I want your vote. I really appreciate you voting for me. But even if you don't want to vote for me, please vote and get other people to vote because we need to reach that quorum. And you know what, Joseph? The quorum is 25%. So that's 1,200 roughly property owners that have to vote in order to certify an election, which is a crazy low number. And I have no idea yet where where we stand. Last week, we were at only about 16 and a half or 16.7% still. And the election is supposed to be held this Saturday. I'm hopeful because I and I know others have also sent election information out. And I'm hoping that we will definitely have a quorum. Uh, and as I said, I'd, uh, I would love to be one of the people elected. There are three board seats open. But either way, people should take an interest in the community, at least enough to vote for the board, for heaven's sakes. Mm -hmm. We all are part of the same community, wherever we are, and we should be involved. We should take enough of an interest to be involved to some degree wherever we can. That doesn't mean right. we need to do everything, but you're absolutely right. We do need to be involved and take an active interest. Right. Some go down the well and others hold the rope, but, you know, be part of it. Be. Someone once said to me, and I've always loved this quote, you know, don't curse the darkness, light a candle. Yeah. And I've heard people say pictures are worth a thousand words, but they also take a lot more memory. So, you know, um, but you're right. And, and a candle or whatever you do, be a part of it. Um, that's yeah. one of the things that I think is, is so discouraged is people being a part of things. And, and there are too many people who are just not used to being active. And it doesn't mean that you need to be an activist, but you should be involved and have enough of an interest that you can help the community and, and that will always help yourself as well. Right. You know, find find what you're good at and do the best at what you do. Yeah. So you have nine children. You've been married 27 years. And when you went mm -hmm. to Cambria on a bike, now was that a tandem bike or did you ride yeah, by that yourself? Yeah, that, that, that was a tandem. How long yeah. did that take? Uh, 11 days. And it was a distance of 1,486 kilometers. And it was interesting because there was maybe – I think there was 12 people that, that rode all the way from Perth across through Adelaide where they met up with us and on to Canberra. And so what happened was as we got closer to Canberra, more and more bikes would join us. So by the, the last kilometre or so, we had like 300 bikes, 300 wow. cyclists. It was, it was fantastic. Did you make your monetary goals? Uh, yes, but thankfully back then I had other people sorting all that out. I just had to ride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't uh, get involved in the the, the no. money counting and the money changing. No, that's okay. Um, but you were a participant, and I'll bet have a lot of fun and fond memories of that. Yes, indeed. Um, now, go on. Your 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 children, um, I assume, are are not. None of them are blind because they didn't have the same issue of premature births and so on, or. Correct. None of them are blind. A few of them wear glasses, though, but for totally different reasons. Well, a lot of people wear glasses, though. It's okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So you, um, you, you do, you do a lot of different things. Do you do any extracurricular activities, or do you think you're doing enough things that you don't get involved in sports or any of those kinds of things? I, I don't have any spare time i mean <laughs> if i'm not if i'm not doing family things and i'm not doing farm things and i'm not doing work things and i'm not doing music things and i'm not doing writing i'm usually trying to get a bit of sleep but um people have often joked that i don't sleep because i get so much done during the day i, yeah. I just like being productive I, I think i'm hyperactive so i i can't stand doing nothing what do you farm <laughs> i hear you what do you farm um we have sheep a few cows and a heap of goats um i tend to do more of the maintenance sort of stuff on the farm um the children look after the animals um i i have done hay baling and fencing and irrigation and 
repairing goat shed floors and things like that. But I usually let the children do the animals. Everybody I'm a seems programmer. to be very <laughs> someone has to take the executive responsibility. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is which is perfectly reasonable, which is not a problem. Tell me about your writing and your books, if you would. Um, I've written six books on very, very different topics. So I've got a poetry book. I've got a, a, a book on, it's called More Than Meets the Eye. I've got a, um, a, a book on my, my journey as a Christian and the things I've learned, um, doctrinal things that I want to pass on to my children called Sufficiency of Scripture. I've got another book about uh, biblical relationships. Um, and I've got a homeschooling curriculum, which I did with my wife on Braille and blindness, bri bri blindness, Braille and the Bible. I have a book on computer programming as a homeschooling curriculum called The Perfect Programmer, referring to God as the one who's programmed everything in the DNA. Um, and I'm currently working on a, a book for a missionary friend who's who's really at the end of his life, who worked in West Papua for 25 years, and he's got interesting stories of cannibalism and airplane crashes and all kinds of stuff. So I've been doing working on that one um, most recently. So, yeah, very, very varied. Do you um, publish the books yourselves or do you have a publisher? I did have a publisher, but they went broke thanks to my books. Um, <laughs> oh, well. And you no, know, so I managed to get the manuscripts back from them and then we self-published after that, which was a lot cheaper to do. Well, um, but you seem to be uh, doing pretty well with them. I was just looking um, and I don't think that you sent me any photos of book covers, but if you want to promote any of those, send those to me. And when this goes up, I definitely would be happy to make sure that the, the book covers are featured as part of what, uh, of what we put up if you'd like. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. That would, uh, that would be fun to do, but you know, um, you've, you've clearly accomplished a lot and are ha more important than anything. You're having fun doing it. And I think that's the, the really big issue that, if, if we can't have fun doing what we're doing, then, you know, where are we? Oh, absolutely. And I, I think that's the thing, that we can live extremely fulfilled lives and lives that are meaningful in our community. So, you know, as I said, there are, there are consumers and there are producers. And as I think, it's just like the Bible says, it's all. It's better to. It's it's more blessed to give than to receive. I think it's it's far more exciting to be a producer than a consumer. And it's always better to help people learn to fish rather than just giving people fish. Yes, exactly. If you were to give some advice of any sort to, let's say, people who could see, what would what would you um, like people to take away from this? There's a toughie. Mm, yeah. Are you talking specifically about how sighted people see those with a disability? Um, you could start there if you'd like, but um, whatever you feel would be relevant um, advice to give people. Certainly talking about disabilities is, is one pertinent thing, but I didn't know whether you wanted to even go further. Find out what you what you like doing do it to the best of your ability and help others in the process it doesn't get much better than that clearly what would you say about disabilities then for to to people who don't view themselves as having a disability um sighted people about blindness and so on well i i agree with you that attitude is everything i would also though say that it is difficult as a as a person with a disability relate uh, interacting with those who don't have a disability in a family situation and i don't think anyone prepared me mm -hmm. um 
let me rephrase it because of the the time the time at which i grew up the emphasis was on blind people can do anything but what they didn't tell me was how my disability was going to affect my family mm -hmm. and so it is it is one thing to be proactive in terms of education and to and to break the glass ceiling to, so to speak there is also though the the reality of living in a world where most people are different from you and being responsible and reasonable and sensitive about how your disability affects others and particularly you know uh, your your wife and your children um they are often the wings the wind between the wind beneath our wings and they often tolerate a lot from us that other people don't necessarily notice the, the carers and the the people who you know we don't make it by ourselves we really don't we're all interdependent and i guess i i want to emphasize that too that there are people in our lives who don't have the disability that we have who really help us to be who we are and we must give them credit Absolutely. The other side of that, though, is that those people also, whether they recognize it or not, have had help along the way. I, I believe in something that Gandhi once said, which is that interdependence ought to be as much the ideal of man as is self-sufficiency. Uh, because the absolutely reality is we're, we're absolutely an interdependent world all the way around. And, and I think it's important to, to recognize that, that all of us get help in so many different ways from so many different people, whether we realize it or not. And it is also true that sometimes we don't even know how we've helped other people, but if we're living our lives, we're helping other people as well. Yeah, that's right. No, I really, I, I really like that. I think that, the problem is when you don't have a disability, you tend not to think of yourself as in interdependent. Right. And that's oh, part of, and right. that's part of the, that's part of our problem as well. Yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah. that's why that's why people don't recognize their need for God in, in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Is is because they're they're too self dependent. Or they think they are. And, um, well, they think they are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. What, yeah. what kind of advice would you give now, say, to a blind person about um, whatever? As a blind person, don't, don't expect everyone else to make your, li your life accessible. Get out there and do it and, and, and contribute and be a producer and not a consumer. <laughs> it's so true, right? Mm. I mean, that's exactly what we all need to do and we need to learn to do it. It is so unfortunate that in society, we just don't teach enough of that to, to people in general. I think we used to do it more than we do it today, but we really need to teach people to learn to step out, take risks when appropriate, and, and learn what when appropriate means, but don't just sit back. It's better to be a driver than a passenger. Yeah. I, I think the, in, in all fairness though, because of the, the move to integrate blind people into sighted schools very, very, very early without the special education, um, quite often blind people don't have the, the, the networks that they once had, um, not that you want to only be in a blind world. You, you need to be in the, a sighted world and a blind world. Yeah. But the problem is if you don't, if you've, if you've never had the opportunity to learn how to do sighted things in an, in an efficient way, I mean, 
we we really need like blind people to be me- help be mentors and things like that too yeah. you know and i'm certainly willing to do that yeah i i hear you and and the um, but the other the other part about it is that um i think there are a lot of in in this country there there are a lot of attempts to provide teachers um to help the problem is that from a philosophical standpoint and a practical standpoint, they themselves don't get the training that they truly need to help blind people truly understand what independence is all about and how to be independent. And the the result is that they don't teach some of the skills that they could teach or that they could contribute to teaching better than they do. Um, So the teachers themselves can be a part of the problem and shouldn't be, but they are. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. Particularly in Australia, as I said, with this article, the rise and fall of life skills, it, it got to a peak. You know, it, back in the fifties and sixties, people, blind people, were weaving baskets. Then there was the, the, the attitude of blind people can do anything. And then we moved to integration. So we had special education. Then we moved into early integration. And it got earlier and earlier and earlier till the special education went out the window. And, mm-hmm. and some people say it was because of budget and government spending, et cetera. But, but the reality is we've gone backwards now. On the to fifth? Before, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, to before um, the, 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 the upward trend, yeah. which is quite sad. On the episode number five of this podcast, we interviewed a, a lady named Peggy Chong, who is known as the Blind History Lady. And uh, she specializes by choice in learning the history of blind people and blindness and so on. And she, among other things, talks about the fact that in the past, as late as in the 1940s or around 1940, I think I'd have to go back and listen. We had as many as three blind congressmen in the United States, and there's been one blind senator. Now we have none um, Mm. because society has decided once again that blindness is really more of a problem in the wrong way than it is. And I think that happens so much in the world, which is truly unfortunate. She has a lot of interesting stuff. Go ahead. I, I ran as a um, a candidate for a political party twice in uh, 2010 and 2016. So, yeah, there's a lot of stigma attached still mm-hmm. uh, in getting blind people into places of leadership. She also tells a story about the invention of the typewriter, which was really for a blind countess who, want, countess who wanted to be able to exchange or have notes go to her lover without her husband finding out. Uh, It's a fascinating story. So if you get a chance, go back and check out episode five. It's really kind of fun. Well, Mm. I am going to thank you for being here. We've been doing this an hour already. We could probably go on, but I think we've given people enough to think about, don't you? Oh, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate you being here. How can people maybe reach out to you and learn more about you or learn about the books and all that? We have a website called Faithful Generations dot com www.faithfulgenerations faithful generations.com um, that's where you can read about my testimony and uh, books um, it doesn't have anything about our music music's on bandcamp uh, two servants t w o s e r v a n t s two servants on bandcamp and b a n d c a s t B-A-N-D-C-A-M-P, band Oh, camp. band camp. Actually, okay. actually our, 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 our first album is actually available on most of the pr- platforms now, like Spotify and that, Two Servants. Um, it's called Further Down the Road. The next album coming out is Over the Hill, and then maybe it will be Under the Turf. I'm not sure. But, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, because the guy that I started singing with back in 1986, he's now 73, and I'm 51, and um, so... It's just a little private joke between us. The, the album well, I'm age. 73. He's okay. Yeah, exactly. You don't <laughs> sound 73. He doesn't sound 73 either. <laughs> <laughs> well, we keep trying. Yeah, exactly. Well, this has been fun, and I want to thank you for listening. 
love to hear your thoughts about any of this. And uh, you are welcome to reach out to me. You can reach me, Michael H-I at accessibe, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E dot com. Love to hear your thoughts. We didn't even talk about accessibility or anything today, but we had enough other fun things to talk about. Um, we could have a whole hour, probably you and I on artificial intelligence in general anyway, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope people will reach out to to me, Michael H-I at accessibility.com or go to www.michaelhingson.com slash podcast singular and listen to more episodes, but wherever you're listening, please give us a five-star rating. We appreciate it. We value your thoughts and your comments and your ratings and reviews. So please give us a five-star rating and let us know your thoughts and don't ever hesitate to reach out. And Joseph, for you and for you listening, if you know of anyone else who might make a good podcast guest, please email me, please let me know. We are always looking for more folks to interview, and we appreciate your help to find them. And a number of people have done that over the past year and a half plus, and I'm sure we'll get more of those. So don't hesitate to give us your suggestions. We are always looking for people to talk with. So, Joseph, once more, thanks very much, and I really appreciate your time and all of your your good thoughts today. Thanks for having me. Nice to speak to you. Thank you.